So a couple of weeks ago I uploaded a video about using the Fujifilm for the very first time and how I was adopting a new system, a new way of working whereby I was shooting video and images with this camera and with the support of a GoPro because I was going on an upcoming trek to Nepal where I needed a more minimalist and lightweight setup. Well I'm happy to report, and I don't know if you can tell this by the scraggy nature of my unkept hair. <laughs> what? But I'm happy to report that I am back from Nepal safe and well. And I feel incredibly qualified to talk about the Fuji X-T3. This isn't going to turn into a Fuji channel. I still have my Canon. I still want to concentrate the majority of my content on in the field videos. But I just, well, the truth is I haven't had time to edit my images. I haven't had time to edit my in the field videos. And I did, I want to talk about my experiences in Nepal and a big part of that was this camera. So that's what we're going to do in today's video. My first in the field video comes out on Christmas Day, which is next week. So if you've had a few too many beers and a bit too much turkey and you want to relax with a good inspirational video, uh, you know, hiking, photography and all that good stuff, well that starts on Christmas Day. So make sure you tune in or if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you subscribe because most of the content on this channel is in the field landscape photography stuff where I go hiking and camping and take, you know, images, some good, some not so good, but it's all about the journey. You know that, don't you? So I'm going to throw together a quick 30 second teaser trailer of what you can expect from the upcoming in the field videos from my trekking trip through Nepal. Today's day five, and I've been keeping notes. Went from feeling good to feeling funny very quickly. Um, unfortunately, I got struck down with AMS, which is acute mountain sickness or altitude sickness. Got light! Shoot! Two second timer, actually, do you know what? 10 second timer, because I'm on full wobble. It's just, you know, it's not, it's not the best picture in the world. Everest isn't the most attractive mountain out there. So, I don't know this for sure, but I just got eyeballed by a helicopter pilot, and it looks like they may have wanted to land where, <laughs> where I am. My God, this has been hard. But look at the view. <laughs> look at the view. So all of that is coming up in the next few weeks. And before we go into today's video about my experiences with this camera and the images and the image quality issues, I just want to quickly mention one thing. Um, me and Brendan Van Son were running a workshop to Bolivia. It sold out last year. Unfortunately, we've had to cancel. Never canceled a workshop before, but if you follow the news, there's been, it's all kicked off in Bolivia you know, this political chaos. So it's not safe to travel there. So we've canceled it and instead we're running a replacement or a substitute workshop to Peru, which is gonna be equally as epic. Most people from Bolivia have transferred over to Peru with the exception of a couple of people who didn't want to and that's fair enough. So we have three spaces available for a workshop in Peru from May, the 1st, 1st of May, to the 13th of May 2020. We're going to be doing Machu Picchu, uh, Lake Titicaca, the Colk Canyon and, and loads more locations. It's going to be fantastic. I won't go on about it but if you are interested in that workshop with myself and Brendan Van Son, I'm sure many of you know who he is, then I will leave a link in the description below. Okay now that I've got that out of the way let's talk about this camera and how it performed in extreme conditions and uh, how I performed in extreme conditions. And I just want to give an overview of the whole experience. This, consider this an informal chat. I, d I haven't had time, as I said, I haven't had time to put together the videos. So I just wanted to, um, just, just to have a chat basically. 
Ah, the Fujifilm, how did it perform? I had reservations. I had concerns with battery life, I had concerns with weather sealing, I had concerns with reliability. Um, flawless, absolutely flawless. Um, believe it or not, batteries, not even an issue. I think it's because I was more aware of how shoddy the batteries are, therefore I used the camera more efficiently, but I was able to pretty much film and photograph an entire day on one battery. I don't know, I don't know how I did it, and it was cold, um, but I never ever ever found batteries being an issue, fair enough, I had five of them, but still. Uh, weather sealing, now, the the trails in Nepal, by the way, I did the Gokyo trek and the Everest base camp trek, the trails are very dusty, it's like walking on talcum powder, it gets everywhere, it's horrifically dry, it's a horrendous environment to work in, you have to cover your mouth when hiking, cover your mouth and nose as much as possible because you get the kumbu cough otherwise. Um, so how did these, because these aren't weather sealed, so how did this camera and lenses perform? Very well. Um, I never once found dust on my sensor and I did not baby this camera. I changed lenses in the field as and when was necessary without concern about dust. So that wasn't an issue. What I found towards the end of the trip uh, is dust actually inside of the lens and behind the glass, which is not good, but it's kind of to be expected. Um, so actually, if anybody knows a service in the UK who can clean and service Fuji gear, please let me know, because this needs looking at. Um, but it never really affected the images, so not a concern. Um, Cold weather, how did it handle? It was, you know, average temperatures were between minus five and minus 10 occasionally. Uh, you know, we would be out in minus 14, minus 15. No issues there at all. The, I suppose minor issue, but to be expected is you power the camera on, it takes about a second to fire up, not really a problem. Uh, there was no bugs, there was no glitches, nothing at all happened with this camera um, and it performed flawlessly. So I have to say, very, very impressed with this. Me, on the other hand, <laughs> I did not perform so well. Um, I'm not gonna give too much away in this video. Uh, you'll have to watch the upcoming videos from in the field. I got diagnosed with moderate AMS. Um, moderate AMS is pretty bad. Uh, mild AMS, not a problem. Relax for a day or two, let your body recover, and then you can continue up. Um, moderate AMS, no you go down, because if you continue up, then it turns to severe AMS, and then it's a helicopter rescue job, and we didn't want that. So at some point during my trek through the high altitude mountains of Nepal, I had to turn around, leave the group, and leave the trail. And I'm not gonna give anything away, you'll have to watch the videos, but I was a wreck, and the yeah, I was destroyed. Absolutely destroyed, physically and mentally. It's all because of the altitude, so yeah, tune in to see all that chaos unfold. Well, it wasn't chaos, but you know, in my mind it was. What about the photography? Uh, the photography was, you know, this trip was an experience, a life-changing experience, I'm going to say, because it's the hardest thing I've ever done. I don't mean physically, like everything's against you. Everything, there's no running water, there's no power, there's no heating. The altitude is constantly beating you down. Everything's a challenge. Keeping, just keeping warm, keeping everything clean. Uh, it's just hard. And on top of that, the photography was very, very challenging. You'd think being in the, the Himalaya mountains, you're surrounded by giants. You'd think it would be easy and obvious. Well, let me tell you, it's not. It's anything but easy, anything but obvious. The light was often against us. And the, the biggest challenge for me was that inability to be able to go and explore. You would have an 8,000 meter peak in front of you in a valley, and that was your shot. There was no room to go and explore. It's not like working in Zion National Park, for example, where you can you know, explore every nook and cranny and grove and canyon and all that sort of stuff. It's, if you see something in Nepal that you want to go and explore, well, you can't because you're at altitude and three steps nearly knocks you down, you know? Going off for an hour, trying to explore a remote little side canyon, it just doesn't, you know, you're looking at a three day trek to get to the side canyon that you wanna go and explore. So that was the biggest challenge, um, was 
accepting the fact that what you see is what you get. Um, so in some sense, yeah, okay, point and shoot, but in others you really had to work very hard to be creative and get something a bit different. Again, all of this is gonna come out in the in the field videos. So let's talk about the images and the image quality. Now I represent somewhat of a perfect storm. I am the average Fujifilm consumer. I have a 5D Mark IV, I use Lightroom and Photoshop. That's my workflow and I love it and I will be damned if I'm gonna change it. But all the advice that came to me about this camera suggested that perhaps Lightroom might not be the best option for the RAW files from this camera. I had a lot of suggestions to try Capture One. So I've been back a day and I've not had much time, but I have had some time and I've downloaded a free trial of Capture One just to see what all the fuss is about. And I really wanted to do a very, very early, very basic comparison between Lightroom and Capture One. Really just to, just because I don't want to use Capture One and I needed to know that it wasn't necessary. Is it necessary? <laughs> Well, let's find out. Right, this image here, this image of this monkey, what a fantastic photograph. I love this photograph. It's not a landscape, I know, but it was an opportunistic shot. I grabbed it, I'm very, very happy with it. So this was the first image that I processed this morning. I processed it in Lightroom. This is the image in Lightroom, and it looks fantastic. You know, I see no problems with this photograph, but, it's not a landscape photograph. It's not typical of what I would shoot. You know, this is shot at wide open at f4, um, high ISO, ISO 640. And, you know, as, as nice as it is, it's not what I would normally shoot. But either way, I processed it in Lightroom and then I processed it in Capture One. So now we're in Photoshop and this is the image of the monkey from Lightroom. And you can see here at the top it says enhanced. So amongst many emails from Fuji users, another piece of advice that I got was to use Lightroom's new enhanced details feature, which basically gets rid of the worming effect and gives you a cleaner file. And I don't know too much about it. I'm literally hours into this experiment, but I wanna give you my first impressions of an average consumer. And let's face it, most people don't want to switch. Most people don't want to change. Most people want to do the easiest route possible to a good quality image, and I'm representing that person right now. So, this is my Lightroom image. I do not see a problem with this at all. It's sharp, it's clean, it looks good. I don't see any real worming effect, even when I zoom into like 300%. So the enhanced details features or feature of Lightroom seems to have done the job. Now I just did my basic standard processing here, nothing crazy, highlight shadows, a bit more light on the face, bit of sharpening. I did the exact same thing in Capture One. Here's the Capture One image. And I have to say, at this stage of processing both images, now I would say I didn't do a side-by-side -side perfect match processing job, I just processed one, a couple of hours later processed it again in Capture One. So I didn't have them open side by side. Um, so yeah, maybe I should, but this isn't a scientific test. This is just for my own peace of mind. And what I can see from the monkey image, excuse me for waffling on here, is that the Lightroom version, I much prefer to the Capture One version. So here's the Lightroom version and the Capture One version. And actually, you know, there's not that much difference in quality that I can see and the processing's different and it's going to be because I've never used Capture One. So with Lightroom, I know exactly how to achieve the look I'm going for. In Capture One, I had to play around a bit more and it took me a lot longer. But here's the thing. This isn't a landscape image, right? This is completely different to how I would normally shoot an image. So let's look at a landscape image that's been edited in Lightroom and then in Capture One. And you know, I'm sorry to say that there is quite a difference. This image is a challenge for this camera. It's shot in the blue hour. There are deep shadows, bright highlights with the snow on the mountains. You know, it's a lot for this camera to handle in one exposure. So when I process this image in Lightroom using the same enhanced details features and just going through my normal processing routine, um, you know, I wasn't, 
overly happy with the image quality. To me, this image feels a bit bitty, a bit dirty, a bit gritty, a bit not noisy, it's just the shadows and the mid-tones and it doesn't feel like a nice crisp clean image. It feels like it's being crunched. That's what it feels like to me and I've done no excessive processing on this. This is just a, a, a basic edit. In fact, let's look at the Lightroom file here, this one. So you can see from my settings on the side here, not no, I'm not pushing anything. You know, this is a pretty standard shot. And actually it looks okay, but it still feels a bit bitty and a bit noisy and it feels like it's degraded in quality. I then process the same image in Capture One, hoping for the same results as the monkey. Sadly, it was not the case. The image in Capture One is fantastic. <laughs> I don't want it to be fantastic. I wanted it to be bad. I wanted them to be the same. I did not want Capture One to outperform Lightroom. But on my very, very brief, short test with no real experience in Capture One, no real scientific anything, you know me, you know me, I just use stuff. I don't know. I don't, I don't let the blooming technicians deal with how it all works. I just use what's in front of me. And after 10 minutes in Capture One, again, pretty basic editing, you know, not a great deal done. I have a very similar result to Lightroom, but the image is just so much, so much cleaner. It's cleaner, it's sharper, it looks like a better, oh, <laughs> it looks like a better file. And you know what? It looks like a Canon 5D Mark IV file. That's what it looks like. That's what Capture One has done to the Fuji files. I am not paid by Capture One. They don't know I've downloaded their software and I don't want to use their software. I don't want to um, because I don't want to change my workflow. I don't want more expense, but it looks so much better, noticeably better. 30% better. I don't know how you quantify that 30%, but it just looks better. Crisp, clean, sharp. I can see it here on this monitor. It's as clear as day, and it has thrown a spanner in the works, because now, does that mean I'm gonna have to process all of my Fuji files in Capture One? <sighs> Maybe I could knock them all out in my 30-day free trial. But then, what do I do going forward? I don't know, I don't know. That is the conclusion of this video. It raises more questions than it answers. But what I would like to say is that I, I've only been back a day and a half. I'm still jet lagged. I've still got lots of images to process, lots of pieces of advice to try. So I will release a supplementary video on this channel with a final conclusion about how I get the best result from the raw files of this camera, specifically for landscape photography. Um, that's that's what I'm gonna do because at the minute I'm still clueless but uh, initial reports are inconclusive the monkey looks great in Lightroom the mountains look great in Capture One who'd have thought it eh? never thought I'd say that so I'm gonna leave it at that I mean look it's been a fantastic trip and um, I'm really excited to release the first video next week so make sure you tune into that or in for that and I'm gonna leave it there so thank you so much for watching and until next time Bye for now. Okay. So, I'm guessing that everybody's gone now, apart from the loyal subscribers. Um, or maybe you went out to a cup of tea and you come back and I'm still waffling on. But I just wanted to mention something at the end of this video, like a secret little thing. Um, I'm working on a project with a few good friends of mine, Adam Gibbs, Nick Page, Gavin Hardcastle, and we've come together as a collective. Think of us as the, a, a photography rock band, but obviously we're not a band. Um, we've called ourselves F4, that's the name we've given ourselves, and we've come up with this crazy idea for a project, which we'll be doing in January, and I'm not gonna give too much away, but we have created a teaser website, a teaser webpage, if you go to f4roadtrip.com and have a look, 
then there is an opportunity for you to sign up to a newsletter where you'll get to learn more information. But all I can say is that we have big plans for January and it's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be something that I don't think has been done before in a way that we're doing it. I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, go to f4roadtrip.com and uh, check it out. That's what I wanted to say. All right, thanks for sticking all the way to the end. And until next time, bye for now.